the world. A dangerous place where everything sucks all of the time. But Metroid games are fun. And while Nintendo hasn't exactly been cranking them out, indie developers have the genre more than covered. In fact, they've made too many Metroidvanias to keep up with. Just to hammer the point in, by the time I finish this review, at least 17 of these games will have sequels out. I wanted to not only review the biggest games in the genre, but also compare how they interpret the Metroid formula, which I like to break down into three parts. The first is an intricately designed world that rewards players for exploring and backtracking. The players should be challenged to remember any obstructions and to find the power-ups they need to overcome them, treating the world like a puzzle they unravel room by room. If the game is extremely linear and directly tells the player where to go, it's doing this wrong. The power-ups should be rewarding enough that the player is continuously motivated to keep seeking them out, which means there should be a palpable increase in strength with each one collected. New abilities should be the main drivers of progress and the keys that open up new areas to explore. If you were to cheat and start the game with every power-up, you should be able to go anywhere. If you're constantly faced with locked doors that you can't do anything about until a cutscene or some arbitrary event happens, the game is doing this wrong. And finally, the game needs to have a strong and varied atmosphere. Having diverse areas with distinct moods helps keep the exploration interesting, and having a wealth of memorable rooms makes it much easier to navigate and backtrack. If the entire game looks and sounds the same, it'll be boring and everything will run together. I'll be grading the games in these categories and will pretend that this is an authoritative system that makes sense. The first game in the list is one of the most acclaimed indie games ever made. I've even seen praise placing it above Super Metroid as the best game in the genre. Can Hollow Knight live up to that hype? No. But the quality of the game smacks you in the face right away. It has gorgeous sprite work with a dark, ominous style that resembles the H.R. Giger artwork that inspired Alien crossed with an old Disney cartoon. The characters have great animation that lends them a lot of personality, like the map maker that hums when nearby. <laughs> Audible hints like this are given throughout the game for secrets that might not be visible on screen. The audio in general is great, with enemies exploding into sickening splats and drips and tighter corridors producing muffled sounds. The soundtrack is mostly dramatic piano and string pieces that suit the somber tone of the game extremely well. And it's good that the tone is so subdued, because the actual gameplay is unrelentingly intense. Team Cherry wants every inch of the map to kill you, with spike traps, dive-bombing shriek bats, and a nearly endless stream of bosses. It's definitely one of the tougher games in the genre, but the controls are tight enough that it's probably going to be your fault when you die. Your character's movements are sharp and precise, and the bright white mask is easy to track no matter how quickly the fights move. The core moveset in the game is fairly simple. You can jump, slash, and do a quick dash during combat. And while there are expansions to get as you go through the game, many of them just enhance the combat abilities you already have, with the rest introducing new ways to travel, like the ripoff of Metroid's Shine Spark. Your progress depends almost entirely on these power-ups, just as a Metroidvania should. In fact, I had to cheat using a save editor to recreate some footage and was able to go pretty much wherever I wanted with just a few abilities enabled. And even with every ability, it can take a while to get where you need to because the map is absolutely massive. Massive and BORING! The dark blue-gray mood in the first area is the same blue-gray mood as the middle and end areas. It rarely evolves or shows you anything different. What you're seeing here is about as much as the tone shifts, and it's basically the same thing, but purple now. It's purple now? It's purple now! If the developers had only used the first area's tile set and song for the whole thing, it wouldn't have made that much of a difference in most areas. And being one of the longest and most expansive examples of the genre, Hollow Knight desperately needs more variety than this. The game also blows it when it comes to power-ups, because the majority of secrets in the world don't power you up. One of the key drivers of a Metroid game's momentum is the steady gain in strength you get from every little missile tank or beam upgrade. Most of the secret passages in Hollow Knight lead to a power refill, an egg, an emblem, or a journal entry. Even up to the last moments of the game, I still didn't know what half of these items even did and had to search it to find out that you just hawk them for money. The only secret I consistently enjoyed was finding members of the Grub family, and even that just mostly leads to money. Super Metroid delivered upgrades with just the right pacing to keep you satisfied without overpowering you. You really have to enjoy the precious few power-ups in Hollow Knight that actually do something, because it could be hours before you see the next one. Perk-style enhancements are the most common upgrades and you're severely limited to equipping just a few at a time, meaning you can't really enjoy the powerful ones without getting rid of everything else. This would almost be like Super Metroid only letting you use three power-ups at once. Buying more slots requires that you've found one specific shop that's easily missable, which is pretty much the story for many other critical systems in the game. 
The developers don't really care what you find and what you don't, so obliviously passing one room in this massive map can put you at a major disadvantage the entire game. The general lack of reward is odd, as if the developers are daring you to stop playing. This is a game where you can finally beat a boss and die at the same time and never see the outcome you've been working for. Where you can finish off half a dozen collectathons only to get rewarded with trees spewing sentence fragments before once again having to google what the point is supposed to be. The world is challenging enough that just getting around requires the kind of dexterity that Metroid games usually reserve for getting the toughest secret items, only for so many destinations to end up barren or pointless with your current status. Or just always pointless. And when you have to work hard to get somewhere only to be turned back to navigate that same spike-riddled terrain again empty-handed, it becomes a chore to play. I assume the color scheme of the game was inspired by the blue balls playing it gives you. Apologies to my female viewer. I'm expecting a lot of get good in the comments, but the problem isn't that the game is challenging. The problem is that the more demanding and exhausting a game is to play, the greater the rewards should be, and Hollow Knight gives less than any Metroidvania I've ever played. There are tons of optional bosses in the game that are tough as nails, some taking dozens of attempts to defeat, and in most cases I wouldn't have bothered had I known they were optional and how inconsequential it would be. And that's another issue I have with the game. It's too open for its own good. Everyone hates extreme linearity, but as anyone who has played a lot of Metroid ROM hacks can tell you, going in the polar opposite direction doesn't work either. Developers have to balance the map between being linear enough to keep a sense of purpose and momentum, while being open enough that the player feels as if they're able to make choices. Hollow Knight allows you to aimlessly wander into fights or areas you aren't equipped for and rarely ever gives you any indication whether this is the thing you're supposed to be doing or not. At one point I took on this side boss, apparently much earlier than I should have been, but still managed to beat it. I explored the new area that opened up expecting that I might find some kind of power up for the effort only to be dropped into Deep Nest, one of the most dangerous areas of the game, which also happens to be hard to see in if you don't have a lantern yet, which I did not. After dying in a few difficult to reach spots and losing all my money, I gave up on exploring it and just tried to find the way back out, which wasted at least half an hour. Allowing players to enter areas they aren't prepared for is one thing. Trapping them in areas they aren't prepared for is basically punishing the player for exploring and being curious, which is one of the worst things a Metroidvania can do. The only thing like this I can think of in a game that's actually good are these floor traps from Super Metroid. But here, there's no risk of losing anything, they're very brief, and you learn valuable skills from them. There's a point. The pit in Hollow Knight was just a total loss to explore at that moment. And things like this, combined with a lack of power-ups and barely changing tone, sap all the momentum out of the game. I'd estimate that as much as 30% of my playtime was spent traveling between benches and boss fights over and over. It's typical for Metroidvanias not to have checkpoints, but it's also typical to put a save point before a boss room. Somehow in my time with this game I'd forgotten that this used to be common sense game design to prevent the player from repeating the same tedious work over and over. And with so few benches, you basically can't pass any up when traveling without getting royally screwed with massive setbacks. They should have called the game Sisyphus Simulator. There are often broken benches that force you to travel to the next area to save, or you have to pay to unlock the bench, which is a double punch if you recently died since you'll have lost all of your money. You can only get it back by absorbing your ghost before you die again, otherwise that money is gone forever. And because you probably died in a dangerous area, you have to navigate it again, or sometimes even fight a boss and your ghost at the same time, while frantically avoiding that second death. I mentioned how a lot of the collectibles exist just to trade for cash. If you happen to have that cash on you when dying and don't get it back, that adventuring just became pointless. This would be a little like losing all your missile expansions when dying and only getting one shot to pick them back up. When you put all of this together, the game that Hollow Knight reminds me of most is Metroid 1, because when you make an extremely repetitive game where you have to explore without a map and where death is a punishing cycle of repetition and refilling, you've recreated the tedium of that game. It was so dull that I stopped playing it near the end and only went back to finish it now, years later for this video, and the main satisfaction I got was the knowledge that I don't have to play it again. I'm not saying Hollow Knight is bad. It's still one of the most impressive indie games ever made and the developers have a lot to be proud of. I can admire it, but I can't enjoy playing it. It's big, beautiful, boring, and kind of shitty, just a little bit. The next game is a radical departure in style with the most simplistic visuals of any game on this list. Many pixel art games try to push a little beyond 16-bit graphics, but Environmental Station Alpha goes way back with an early 8-bit look so minimal that it can be hard to even tell what objects are. At a glance, it may not be as impressive as its hand-drawn rivals, but the strict visual economy is part of what makes it interesting. The game does a hell of a lot with just a few pixels, 
and it wouldn't be hyperbole to say that the first 20 minutes have more variety than 20 hours of Hollow Knight. The audio is more on the 16-bit side of things with some great samples for effects and music. Enemies explode like popping balloons. And those are the most laser-sounding lasers I've ever heard in my life. In spite of its simplicity, the game delivers just what you should want. Areas where the atmosphere surprises you in a way that you have to absorb for a moment before going forward. The game is basically a Commodore 64 version of Metroid Fusion. You're tasked with investigating a station split into various biomes, with computer terminals providing objective markers to reach. The difference is that Environmental Station Alpha is far more open, and places the markers far enough away that they're more of a rough direction to head in than a specific route to follow. Power-ups aren't always the key to progress, but if a door has to be unlocked by a computer, it's because you found the terminal to unlock it yourself. There are plenty of power-ups and shortcuts to other sections to discover as the game goes on, and the power-ups actually power you up enough that the search for them never gets old. One of the most important items, the hookshot, is tricky to handle at first, but once you adapt to it, the wacky momentum actually becomes fairly fun to abuse. The game has some diabolical puzzles to unravel, and not once did I ever want to back out of the challenge. And just about every time, the reward was something proportional to the effort. Like Hollow Knight, there are some major assholes in the boss roster, but in this case the fights are intensely brief. You may spend a dozen lives on a fight that's over in just 20 seconds, and because the developer placed save points before these fights, it's easy to try again and again. And playing these games back to back, I have to say that convenience doesn't diminish the actual challenge of the game in any meaningful way. Unfortunately, on rare occasions it shares Hollow Knight's problem of dead-end power-up hunting. There are times when the game turns you away when reaching a difficult secret too early, often without much indication of what you're missing. Some puzzles simply have no solution and are just there to tease, and one or two others can also trap you and force a game reset if you're not careful about what you're doing. If you probe around long enough, you'll find at least a few things that could use more polish. The visuals, while nostalgic and fun, don't always communicate clearly and you should expect a lot of trial and error in figuring them out. Sometimes the parallax scrolling is the only way to sort out what's part of the background and what you can actually stand on. Or maybe you won't know if an object is an enemy until taking damage from it. The faults are pretty minor in this case and don't ruin the game's charm, which holds strong over its relatively brief duration. And if it sounds too short, there's also some post-game content to keep busy with. It's not the biggest or flashiest game on the list, but it's fun, doesn't cost much, doesn't wear out its welcome, and probably deserves a little more recognition than it's gotten. Ori in the Blind Forest is one of the best-looking side-scrollers I've ever seen, seamlessly blending 2D and 3D elements together in a style that resembles Rayman Legends, but with a bend towards Miyazaki films. The game tells a story that's sappy but neat, with Jabba the Hutt occasionally delivering exposition from the background. I believe he just called the main character Bantha Pudu. The basic formula is that you explore a relatively contained area looking for stones to open doorways until finding a special tree that grants new abilities, at which point the area is complete and you move on to the next. The map isn't as intricately connected as the other games on this list, and the trees are usually at a linear dead end, meaning you'll often have to backtrack pretty far from them before finding the way to the next area. The simplicity of the map isn't really a problem, as it lends the first half of the game a nice relaxed pace where you wander and enjoy the scenery without much trouble. And the variety is surprisingly good considering that the vast majority of the game takes place in forest areas that could have ended up too samey. Most of the power-ups you find in between the spirit trees are glowing orbs that basically work like XP. Collecting a certain amount allows you to upgrade existing abilities. In typical Metroid fashion, these are visible all over the map but often inaccessible until getting a new ability. But Ori also does something fairly unique by letting you use nearby enemies and hazards to clear a path instead. Secret passageways more often than not lead to a small alcove with an orb and rarely get more creative than that, which again is fine for the leisurely pace of this game. That all changes about halfway through when Ori begins demanding much more precise platforming, and in my opinion things go a little downhill from there. It's not always clear what the rules are in some of the more complicated sections, and a lot of the mechanics don't really work the way I imagine the developer thought they would on paper. A dash move allows you to vault off of enemies or projectiles, but those enemies often aren't where they're supposed to be for the section to work, or won't fire when you desperately need them to. Stomping is done by pressing down in mid-air, which is far too easy to do in a difficult aerial section, especially when you're not using a great quality D-pad. Most of the time, things like this aren't too frustrating because of the unique save system, which allows you to use some of your attack energy to create your own save points pretty much anywhere. So if you end up having to backtrack a long distance after dying, it's entirely your fault. 
There are a few moments where saving is a bad idea, but I didn't encounter any game-breaking issues with it, which is pretty impressive on the developer's part. But you can't save during certain escape sequences, which require you to do everything in one shot, and this is where those iffy mechanics do become really annoying. The process for beating these is to die many cheap deaths and memorize how to avoid each of them. A first-time player couldn't possibly know that they have to be on the left side of this cave to avoid a sudden boulder drop, or that they have to be in mid-air at this exact moment. It requires a lot of patience to build up the muscle memory to avoid all of these traps and get a run where none of the control quirks do you in, and the camera keeps up with the action. Playing Ori made me appreciate just how well done Hollow Knight was in this regard. As frustrating as that game could be, it was never due to the controls. Ori just isn't as mechanically sound and the action isn't as readable, with the distant camera and numerous lights making it hard to differentiate your character from the rest of the action. Even in the best scenarios, the combat is pretty dull and repetitive. You mainly hammer a button to fire weak light pellets at enemies, which is very slow even after unlocking damage upgrades. Eventually, you can add a stomp and a charge up blast into the equation, but you'll still be fighting the same few enemies over and over throughout the game. The goo thing that shoots spikes, the jumping frog, and the spider are 80% of it. Combat is simply not the game's strength. Ori is at its best when it lets you wander and take in the sights and story without much resistance, which is about half of the game. The more intense parts are very inconsistent and expose a few too many weaknesses in the mechanics, but when the challenges do work, they tend to be really satisfying and it's worth powering through all of it for the visuals alone. Yep. If you want a Metroid game that doesn't have Metroid in the title, Axiom Verge is the game for you. This is probably the closest I've seen a Metroidvania get to capturing the feel of an actual Metroid, but it sets itself apart from the source material by cranking up the weird. It specifically channels the darker and emptier visuals of Metroid 1, but with more emphasis on the hypnotic nightmarish qualities the series occasionally has. It also has far more detail and variety than the first Metroid, with a constant stream of new sights and sounds keeping it compelling to explore. Parts of the world are corrupted in a way that resembles a glitched NES game, which isn't just a cool effect, but an actual mechanic. Enemies and objects can be both fixed and glitched in ways that can be beneficial or harmful depending on the scenario. Rather than basing everything on Metroid, the developer showed a lot of ingenuity in coming up with new powers specifically suited to his world. There are so many weird ideas that work so well and they never let up. Every minute of exploration will turn up some kind of upgrade or new weapon to try. The pace of new abilities is so fast that even going back to an area from just 20 minutes ago can result in a good haul of new items. In fact, there are almost too many power-ups. You probably won't even use half of the beams in the game, and I might have preferred them to stack together rather than all being separate, but they do provide useful options for hitting enemies in every possible scenario, and you'll often find that a beam you've ignored is perfect for a specific boss. The bosses have a different feel than Hollow Knight or Environmental Station Alpha in that they aren't all trying to be white-knuckle bullet hell roadblocks. They have a very old-school approach where the main challenge is figuring out how to attack them, and after that the fight is usually yours. And the game not only puts save points before them but also color codes the boss doors so that you can always prepare for them. Again, this kind of thing only makes the game funner and diminishes nothing. A great soundtrack isn't exactly a rarity in these games, but the music in Axiom Verge is especially memorable. It can be ambient, depressing, dancey, and occasionally weird to the point of being annoying. But all of it suits the mood of the area perfectly. There's also an interesting story with a few twists and some supplemental lore to find if you're into that sort of thing. I didn't mind secrets leading to journal entries here because the game is so saturated with power-ups that a small break from them is never a disappointment. If I had to say anything bad about Axiom Verge, it's that the travel system is the weakest of any game in this list. Indie developers are great at designing individual areas, but organically connecting all of them together seems to pose more of a challenge. Super Metroid and Prime tried to connect everything with tangled shortcuts going everywhere, but modern games tend to favor some kind of warp system instead. Hollow Knight has a beetle that runs to every section, while Environmental Station Alpha and Ori use instant warp points. Axiom Verge's solution is a giant Monty Python head running down a very, very long hallway, which isn't very efficient or convenient to use. That said, it's mainly an issue late in the game when going for a 100% collection. The other thing to say is that the style isn't as original as Ori or Hollow Knight. It is a Metroid clone and it does an incredible job of it, but it does make me appreciate the ambition these other games put into pushing 2D visuals forward. Axiom Verge is more like The Force Awakens of Metroid, recreating something you've seen before but with a new coat of paint. But considering that we've only gotten one decent Metroid from Nintendo in the past decade, I'm fine with that. I can't recommend this game enough. It's really damn good, and the upcoming sequel is one of my most anticipated games this year. 
If you haven't played it yet, just do it, you stupid baby. There are many, many more games to get to, but too many for one video. So if you liked this review, stay tuned for part two. Which games will be included? What will the scores be? Eight? Seven? Will 15 make an appearance? That's for me to pull out of my ass and you to find out. And we are in intermission. Barry, what did you think of Nero's performance so far? Well, I think he heard himself right out of the gate by criticizing Hollow Knight. Mm -hmm. He lost a lot of viewers there, and I think the fans are going to call him out in the comments for not being uh, good at mm -hmm. the game. They know that that's what that means, right. that if the game right. isn't fun, it's because you're not good at it. Do you think he made up enough ground after that? Well, let's face it, he didn't have any credibility mm -hmm. to lose. He said mm -hmm. Breath of the Wild wasn't perfect. Mm -hmm. He said Resident Evil 2 wasn't that great. He said the Star Wars movie was good. Mm -hmm. That's three strikes against yeah. him already. Frankly, it didn't matter what he did out there today. He's not coming back from that.